Good morning. Uh, thank you, Connor and Gio, for the invitation to uh, speak. Uh, it's very interesting. I think the last time I used these slides was around 15 years ago, because everything we've talked about recently has been minimally invasive. We've already talked about total mesorectal excision. Um, what I want to do is show you some of the nuances of an open operation. Before I go any further, can I show, see a show of hands of any, any of you who still do open TME? Okay. How many of you do laparoscopic TME? And how many of you do robotic TME? So is there anyone here that thinks that you should ignore how to do an open TME? All right, good, so I'm not irrelevant. <clears throat> we defined TME uh, in, or the mechanism of TME in the laparoscopic ACASOG Z6051 study as uh, ligation of the IMA at the origin, mobilization of the splenic flexure, transection of the proximal left colon uh, above the sigmoid, dissection in the avascular plane into the pelvis, um, anterior to the presacral fascia, as uh, Dr. Ludwig uh, so elegantly showed you, uh, division of the lymphatics and middle hemorrhoidal vessels on the lateral wall of the pelvis, preserving the nerves, and inclusion of all pelvic fat and lymphatic material uh, at least five centimeters below the tumor in a mid to upper rectal lesion, or the entire mesorectum in a mid to low lesion. So the important thing that I think you should take away from this morning is as you're learning your skills and you're refining your technique is that you make a difference in the outcome of the patients with rectal cancer. 80% uh, of five-year survival in patients with stage two and three rectal cancer is uh, by the, given by the surgeon. If you have adequate lymph node harvest and a clear margin, uh, the survival uh, is impacted. And then radiation may only be necessary to deal with those potentially impacted circumferential radial margins, as Dr. Valdi showed us earlier. That also may mean that we should be able to, in the future, begin to be more selective in the use of neoadjuvant chemoradiation. So you've already seen some of these diagrams. What you're looking at here is the idea of a tumor-specific mesorectal excision, taking out that uh, fat down to a level five centimeters below the bottom of the tumor and maintaining the envelope to the level of transection, which should always be at right angles to the longitudinal axis of the rectum. If you cone in and you leave a portion of that fat behind, you've done the patient no favors. Warren Inker probably drew the first uh, map of where the Holy Plain was uh, in the United States. Uh, Bill Heald had been teaching this in Europe and those of us in the US who were dealing with rectal cancer sort of ignored the idea of a Holy Plain then we started thinking that anatomy is important. There are still parts of our of surgical oncology which has ignored the idea of anatomic envelopes based on an embryologic plane, the esophagus, pancreas, uh, duodenum. And as we get more and more into the surgical aspects of dealing with cancers, I think we're going to find that we really have to go back and look at the embryologic origins of where we're working. You can also see that following this plane down, you're going to run into Waldar's fascia. In the old days, most of us remember someone in the operating room making that sucking sound with the hand down the back of the pelvis, lifting up, and the rectum comes up and they're proud of themselves, and the operation took 30 seconds. The pelvis filled up with blood. There was fat on both sides of the dissection plane, and Waldar's fascia 
was the point of obstruction. So dividing that sharply is key. We've already talked about the pelvic nerve anatomy. There are five areas that you can damage the nerves of sexual function in male and female. And if you pay attention to where those nerves are during your dissection, uh, you can certainly uh, improve the patient's quality of life uh, after the operation. So we call this the forehand port technique with as big of an incision as you can make from xiphoid to pubis with a bookwalter retractor, lifting the, rectal, uh, lifting the abdominal wall up and away from the underlying uh, tissue. We use a wound protector to help keep the uh, spillage off of the uh, exposed tissue. A lighted re retractor in the pelvis is essential. Patient, pa uh, patient positioning on lithotomy so that you can get to the anal canal and place the patient in steep Trendelenburg. Use the gravity that laparoscopy has taught us about uh, in the open operation as well. What you see here is a mobilized splenic flexure. If you can't pull the splenic flexure toward the midline and lift it up and out of the upper abdomen, you have not completely mobilized that splenic flexure. That is the key to a tension-free anastomosis with good blood supply. What you're looking at here is the base of the left colic mesentery during the dissection. The blue is around the inferior mesenteric vein and the red loop is around the IMA. The window behind the mesentery of the left colon can be used to guide you into the avascular plane which comes all the way out of the pelvis up along the left gutter and there is no blood, blood vessel in there that will cause bleeding and it almost can be done bluntly. If you have the IMV ligated at the undersurface of the pancreas, you have taken all of the lymphatics that could impact the patient's recurrence. Uh, the IMA at the origin uh, will have nerves that will affect uh, the ejaculation function in a male, and those nerves can either be dropped down or the ligation can be done at a higher level close to the bifurcation of the left ascending colic artery and the superior hemorrhoidal artery uh, as opposed to right on the aorta itself. If you see an enlarged lymph node at the IMA, you should take it with your specimen. Uh, I would never leave that behind. And this is essentially what you do in a periaortic lymph node dissection uh, to get this picture as you're doing your dissection. Once you've divided the IMA and the IMV and you've mobilized the splenic flexure, now you have a colon that will reach well out of the abdomen and can be moved all the way down into the pelvis to do your anastomosis if that's what you're trying to accomplish. We start at the sacrum. We make an incision in the areolar tissue plane. You can see the nerves that we're protecting as we're going into the pelvis. That areolar tissue plane melts on a cautery setting that is very low. And if you're using a sharp tip, now that we have fuse uh, as an educational uh, method in uh, sages, I would suggest that you switch to a low volume or low voltage or low wattage uh, cutting uh, setting on your, on your cautery. The presacral fascia is your guide. If you can follow that all the way to the pelvis, uh, you've done everything you can to maintain the envelope of the mesorectum. And taking a small, thin, lighted retractor or a malleable retractor to give you upward lift without actually doing the dissection uh, is a secret that you can use in a patient who has an upside down Coke bottle for a pelvis. The opening doesn't have to be very large. My fingers will sometimes only fit two fingers in the pelvis in a small, uh, narrow pelvis. Posterior dissection goes all the way down to Waldar's and you make your incision and then all of a sudden the, the rectum comes up and out of the pelvis. The areolar tissue plane behind the rectum is 
clear when you're finished. And you're going to see this bilobed uh, envelope of fat. The nerves run down both sides. The ureters can be easily protected if you stay right on the areolar tissue plane. And remember that you're operating in a cylinder. So all your motions are semicircles or are more of a swing as opposed to a straight line. The anterior dissection we've already heard is something that needs to follow either anterior to the non VAs based on where the tumor is or behind the non VAs for a higher tumor. But the plane is where you're following. And there is an areolar tissue plane anterior to the rectum. And it can be used to protect the nerves, the nervi arrogante behind the seminal vesicles and the prostate. Here's your specimen again. The mesorectal plane is something that you need to get used to seeing and photographing in your own operating room. If you see a piece of, of um, tumor, or a piece of uh, bowel that comes out looking like this, you've harmed the patient. If you see it like this, you've committed malpractice. And I think what you have to do is realize that now pathologists have been trained to look at your TME specimen, it had better be perfect. The one thing that I would say though is even though we had a 1 to 2 percent uh, local recurrence rate in the Dutch trial, uh, when Phil Quirk went back and looked at it, he found that there was a lot of variability in the quality of the specimen. Neoadjuvant chemoradiation was developed basically to accommodate for the lack of skill for surgeons doing rectal cancer surgery. And I would like us to get away from that and use chemoradiation only for patients who have a threatened circumferential radial margin beforehand on an MRI. Your specimen should be processed in a bread loafing technique because then you can clearly see where the circumferential radial margin is involved. Our grade one in the United States is not near as bad looking as the grade one in the UK. If you have any kind of muscle appearing through the mesorectal fat, that is a incomplete TME. If you have a small divot, it's only a near complete TME, and if it's a smooth surface, it's a complete TME. There have been studies that have shown that a near complete and a complete TME have the same oncologic outcomes, and the fact that you cut into the mesorectal envelope may have some very small impact, but not enough to be detected statistically. We've already seen what a CRM positive looks like on an MRI. That should help you plan your operation. You can almost always detect nodes that are going to be involved. And that should impact where you make your incisions for the abdominal perineal if you're doing a low rectal lesion. We call this the standard APR dissection plane. The problem with this is that if you get all the way down to that and you've got a gooseneck deformity of the specimen, you've already risked your circumferential radial margin. So the idea is that you're going to make that incision if you're going to take out the levators earlier in the operation and you should never actually see the anal rectal ring or the anal verge. You should be in that levator plane heading for the ischial rectal fossa well before you get down into that area where you're going to impact your circumferential radial margins. And the specimen that you obtain is a cylindrical specimen. I know Dr. Delaney is going to spend more time on that. There's also an even more uh, extensive operation that can be done. So we should really never see positive circumferential radial margins in rectal cancer unless the tumor is biologically disaster. So we have been using the multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, as you've already heard, this actually influences the outcome of the, of the total mesorectal uh, specimen simply by showing the pictures of the tumor and the specimen at our MDT conference. You can see that when we first started, the TME completeness rate was abysmal, and now it's up to where it should be, close to 90%.
The American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, or the Alliance Z6051 trial, concluded that laparoscopic resection failed to meet the criteria for non-inferiority for pathology outcomes. Uh, the clinical outcomes are now available. Uh, we see no change in the local recurrence and the survival based on laparoscopic or, or open technique. But my conclusions are that I look at the specimen when I take it out laparoscopically and I say to myself, did I do all that I can do? And so if there's any question at all, and it's difficult dissection in the low pelvis, I'm never hesitant to switch to an open operation. And you can achieve a good outcome, but you need to do it on a regular basis. And what about the rest of the surgical world that are doing 50% of the operations on rectal cancer and they're still doing APRs instead of using selective sphincter sparing techniques, are they going to provide us with an adequate outcome without training and without good experience and ongoing operative experience? So thank you, Dr. Delaney, Dr. Krupp.